Hello and welcome to Campus Vote Elections 2014, our continuing series in businessstandard.com where we try and put the spotlight on the political pulse of the youth in India. Today we come to you from SPJIMR or the SPJN Institute of Management and Research in Mumbai and we'll be speaking to the students here about what it is that makes these elections such a big draw for them. Now Mumbai is often relegated to the shadows when it comes to politics. We don't have all those dharnas and protest movements and agitations as compared to Delhi, but this election is different. The Mumbai region itself has 1.3 crore young voters and Maharashtra itself would also have as many young as old voters casting their ballot. What does this mean for the polity of the state? How will this change politics? What implications will it have? More importantly, what are some of the key concerns and expectations of the youth as we get into elections? Those are some of the questions that we'll be discussing. And I want to thank all of you for, in fact, joining us here. And uh, let's begin uh, with a bit of a snap poll. How many of you perhaps never enthused to vote are actually going to go out and cast your ballot this time around? Just a, a raise of hands to show. All right, so it, it, it's 100% it's it's, it's, it's and that, in fact, is really going to be the game changer in this election. A lot of youth actually expected to come forward and vote. Uh, give me a sense of what it is that makes you want to actually go out and cast your franchise this time around. Uh, well, it's the need for a decisive leadership. Uh, that's what the country needs at the moment. And uh, for youth like us, uh, we, we want to witness growth of the country and we need a strong government for that and yeah and what we have seen in the last few years is that there's been a policy paralysis mm -hmm. so uh, and we need a strong a leader at at the center who can you know take decisions so that's what has been missing for the last few years right you know anybody out here with the critical concerns that you think uh, as we get into the election season especially for the youth uh, the most critical would be uh, more jo income and uh, job generation. Now, for the last five years, the amount of jobs which are being generated every year is declining. So, if we you know, don't arrest this right now, then the, uh, the country is going to head to uh, critical, uh, extremely bad situation. Most importantly, if I uh, point out three main factors which should be the, dr I mean, the governing factors which will be deciding this year's election, the first one will be corruption. Second will be women's safety, and the third will be cross-border terrorism. Which right. we, which I mean, all these three had been uh, increasing by leaps and bounds in the last two or three years, and this has gone off the limits now. Right. So this current, the current leadership that we're, I mean, expecting at this moment, that has to be robust enough to deal with cross-border terrorism specifically, and women's safety will be a high concern that needs to be dealt with at right. this moment. Uh, Professor, I think you actually interact uh, a lot with students on a day-to-day -day basis. How do you think this sort of youth quake, as somebody like Shashi Tharoor uh, described it? Uh, uh, is going to change the way these elections are fought? I think basically Shashi Tharoor is of course out of depth okay. because he has been part of a government which has caused deceleration of growth from 8.5% mm -hmm. right. to 4.5 or 5%, uh, a decline in jobs, uh, a great amount of corruption and scams which have been unprecedented. Sure. We haven't seen these before uh, except in the last 5 to 10 years. This scale of corruption. The trouble is it has also involved corporates and therefore there are serious issues of governance. Right. In the last and and again years. just a raise of hands, how many of you actually think that this government has been solely responsible for bringing growth in India down from 9% to 4%? Anybody else who thinks that there are other factors involved? Uh, your professor mentioned uh, the sort of uh, complicity of corporates with the government. What else do you think has been responsible for this, uh, this sort of uh, uh, abysmal uh, uh, growth that we've seen in India? Uh, one more thing, factor that we must consider is the global environment. Mm. So for, for the last five, ten years, the global environment has also been very challenging. So even if the government is quite complicit in some of the factors, as uh, rightly said, but we also must take into account the global uh, situation right, right now. So right. the government right. cannot be responsible for that. Right, and, and, and uh, he said that we need a decisive leader actually. So uh, give me a sense of who you think is a decisive leader. Who does this, this, this vote go to? If you ask me, I would say AAP. You would say AAP. AAP. How many of you say Narendra Modi? Okay, so it's a majority 
Narendra Modi, but you have uh, a minority uh, over here. Why do you think the Aam Aadmi Party, and in fact, I would uh, come to that because the Aam Aadmi Party uh, has, in fact, been uh, an outlet that saw millions actually come out and vote in the capital uh, in a city like Delhi. Uh, do you think uh, you need that kind of an outfit in a, in a city like B uh, Bombay to change the political discourse here? Yes, of course. Someone should step up. And when someone steps up, it is our duty to support them. Right. And justify the means. Right. And we should not end up criticizing. Yeah. He has come over there into the s politics to clean up politics with clean intentions. His means might not be right. I am not getting into his means and ways. But he has got some good intentions. And it is our duty to support him and he threw away all the odds, all the odds were against him. But in spite of it, he came back with stunning success in Delhi. Right. Ejriwal represents anarchy. Right. While his intention is good, which is anti-corruption, the means that he deploys are anarchist. Mm -hmm. You know, it was demonstrated in the Delhi discussion in the chaotic statements that are being made by his various leaders i mean one shashi shanti bhushan prashant bhushan actually so people you know, often do say professor that you know revolutions come after an anarchy does anybody believe that uh, the aam aadmi party in the means that it adopts are needed possibly to get india out of its slumber you do see i uh, i've been part of the uh, the activities that have happened in delhi Right. I personally was there at uh, Ramlila Maidan during the, all those agitations happened and also I was there at the time when the Arvind Kejriwal took oath at Ramlila Maidan. So there has been a, as they say, there has been a transformation uh, from what happened during the agitation and what has happened after the, uh, the, when, he, when he became the Chief Minister. But the point here is, uh, I believe his ideas and intentions are absolutely right, right. and they are, they are making, they are appealing to the youth. Right. The only thing is he has to perform, start performing and he has to take that decision that he, 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 is the he is the choice and he has to make p people believe in it. Alright, so 10%, I think, you know, roughly 10-15% in this crowd support the AAP, the consensus views in Modi. Is there anybody at all who supports uh, uh, the existing government to come back into power again? Mm -hmm. Must be joking. <laughs> <laughs> anybody out here uh, in this side of the crowd actually uh, have concerns about some of uh, what uh, you know some of the characteristics that Modi displays. He doesn't talk to the press. He doesn't give interviews. He's seen as being authoritarian, uh, uh, apart from being decisive. Uh, would you like to hear Modi more, apart from what he says in his speeches? Anybody who hasn't spoken, in fact. So what I believe is like if Modi doesn't speak uh, with the public, the results can go against him. Mm -hmm. As we, uh, we have seen in Delhi that Arvind Kejriwal have agitated the youth. The youth was not coming to vote as of now. The percentage of the youth people who were voting was very less. So if Modi doesn't take into that account, so the results may go completely against uh, him, whatever the surveys may say as of now. But tell me, for how many of you do concerns like Hindutva versus secularism or caste, language, religion, for how many of you do those matter? Just a uh, you know, a voice vote or hands up. Does that matter to you? Okay. Tell matter me. in the sense, I, I want to say... That I mean, would your vote hinge on that? No, not... That's what I'm going to say is okay. that political parties should come over all these things. That's what okay. I want to say. Okay. I mean, these are... Uh, we can say that AAP has made a uh, significant difference in this wherein mm -hmm. they are not asking mm -hmm. for people to vote on based on their caste, religion mm -hmm. and things like that. Mm -hmm. And which is the politics that we the youth want for now. Right. Uh, Professor, I think, then, I do, think do you think this youth will transcend uh, the boundaries of religion and caste? I think the, the boundaries... The I think both the urban and rural youth are absolutely fed up mm -hmm. of pseudo-secularism and communities being used as a vote bank. Okay. I don't think neither the urban nor the rural youth are interested. Right. Whether it is Hindu, Muslim, Christian, Sikh or whichever the youth, they are interested in a growing India. Okay. They are interested in an India that's infrastructure wise developing. Right. They are interested in jobs and this nonsense of pseudo-secularism and co or communalism, or communalism yeah. are completely non-issues. The yeah. Gujarat model has actually demonstrated that because sure. whatever growth has happened in Gujarat. The state elections have also demonstrated that. Absolutely. Yeah. They, have, they have happened for the benefit of all communities. Okay, any, so. any localites out here? Any Mumbaikers? Okay. Not, not from Mumbai. Uh, you are a Mumbaiker. Yes. So, what are your aspirations for Mumbai? Uh, you know, we've had this dream of, this sort of very unrealistic dream of turning Mumbai into Shanghai right from the Vilasra Deshmukh days. 
Do you think this government or this sort of mandate in 2014 uh, will change anything for Mumbai? Are you hopeful? Okay, uh, firstly, I think uh, it, it, we need a strong government to kind of help us in doing that. Yes, it is possible, but it's not a short story which will, uh, which will take it to a Shanghai kind of a story. Mm -hmm. uh, what we need is a strong corporate governance that mm -hmm. will help in checking whatever issues which have happened. They, a strong government will help in unwinding all those past sins which have happened on the parallelism mm -hmm. and also throw light upon how to, how to economic progress mm -hmm. uh, so that that can be beneficial for the youth as a whole. Social media and uh, the digital media is playing a big role in these elections. People are saying that uh, it's changing uh, our political discourse, it's changing the way politicians communicate with people. Uh, has that been a dominant influencing factor in any of you, social media? Definitely, social media is playing a great role in changing the mindset of the youth, especially the youth who are always connected to the Facebook and the Twitter. Mm -hmm. Now, most of the leaders in the, I mean, in the, cent in the central leadership, if you see, most of the leaders they are connected on Twitter. Even if you see the uh, rising of the AAP movement in Delhi, mm -hmm. that was all whole lot of connected with the mobile campaigning and with the uh, Twitter, with the Facebook. So it is, it is, it is changing the entire. You know, it is making a paradigm shift where you know people used to connect to televisions. You know, the people are more connected to the social. I mean, the social networking sites. It's playing a great role in at least changing the mindset of the people. Right. And, and, and has that also, in some sense, you know, made politics more accessible, make, uh, you know, make politics look like it's more accessible, where you can communicate with your leaders. You also have a lot of people from civil society, from corporate India, bankers, lawyers, joining politics. So do you think this time around, politics has gotten a little more accessible for people like you, that the entry barriers have perhaps reduced? Certainly. So what social media has done is it has made more people interested in in the, in the politics as such. We can see status updates about elections, about leaders and people following their, uh, the, the, the party or the group that they think should, be, should come in power. But what we should also consider is that not all of that information that comes on social media is accurate. So sometimes you have misleading information which, which, can, uh, which can cause a detrimental effect on the, on the voters' mindset. But having said that, I think it's a, it's a great e effort that people kind of are taking that time out to reach out to their leaders and find out what their views are on topics and make them more accountable through the use of social media. This really is the urban voice. They want to go out there and vote. They want a decisive government. And more importantly, they're fed up with the status quo. That's it on campus votes this time around. We will, of course, come back with many more series crisscrossing the country and getting you urban youth voices from BC. Thank you.